Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Sean Hamill, Principal Evaluator with the Division. Today I'm going to present the latest report entitled Allotment Specific and System Level Issues Adversely Affect North Carolina's Distribution of K-12 Resources. You should have in your packets a copy of the full report, today's slides will help you navigate through the briefing, a series of handouts. I printed them in blue and they've been listed as handout one through four. Now if you've had a chance to read the report, it has 12 findings. As a result, we've also included in your packet a digest. This serves to summarize the report in about five pages. The digest provides a crosswalk to the specific sections in the report. Because of the size of the report, this briefing will take about an hour or so. Uh, but we've built a small break right in about the middle. In 2015, the General Assembly directed the Program Evaluation Division to examine the funding formulas the state uses for allocating resources for K-12 public schools. The direction also specified that we examine the feasibility of implementing student-based budgeting for public school finance. To execute this charge, we work with the Department of Public Instruction, referred to here as DPI, to review and analyze both procedure and financial data for the funding formulas. We traveled and met with more than a dozen local education agencies, here referred to as LEAs. We also met with several charter schools. In addition, each LEA had the opportunity to provide feedback and information on the state funding formulas through a survey. We received feedback from 108 of 115 LEAs. We also surveyed each charter school. We want to acknowledge DPI for the excellent cooperation we received throughout the evaluation. But in addition, I need to extend my thanks to both Jeff Grimes and Emily MacArthur, my two team members, for their tireless effort and expertise they provided in support. Again, because this report has 12 findings, uh, we've put this into kind of two sections. Section one will discuss allotment specific issues. Section two, we will address system level deficiencies. And at the discretion of the chairs, we'll take a small break in between the first and the second sections. Again, with respect to the individual allotments, this project found that the structure of the allotment for classroom teachers, the single largest allotment, results in a distribution of funds across LEAs that favors wealthy counties. Funds for children with disabilities fails to observe student population differences and directs disproportionately fewer resources to LEAs with more students to serve. Resources for limited English proficiency students lacks rationale and fails to observe economies of scale, which results in illogical and uneven funding. Small county funding is duplicated and, uns and unsubstantiated. We also found that low wealth funding is overly complex and could be modified to better reflect a county's ability to generate local revenue. Further, the resources for disadvantaged students are disproportionately distributed. And finally, for Section 1, funds for central office administration are disconnected from changes in student membership, creating an imbalance in funding. At a higher level, the allotment system as a whole is overly complex and has limited transparency. Furthermore, the system is guided by a patchwork of laws and documented policies and procedures that fail to explain the system. Additionally, there are features of the system intended to promote LEA flexibility that just blur accountability. In addition, translating LEA allotments to fund charter schools creates several challenges. And lastly, there are other models for distributing resources that offer alternatives that merit consideration. 
To address these findings, we've made five recommendations that are presented in two options. The General Assembly should choose between overhauling the entire system or modifying the current system to address the deficiencies highlighted in this report. I'll now provide some background information on the allotment. Funding for K-12 public education comes from three sources, the state, local, and federal governments. DPI distributes fate, start, sorry, state and most federal resources through the use of allotments. County commissioners determine how local resources are distributed. All total, this was $12 billion in fiscal year 14-15. Our report focuses on the state resources distributed through the state funding formulas, which are more commonly referred to as the allotments. Now before we jump into the substantive information contained in this report, I think it's important for us to establish what allotments are and what they are not. Allotments are distributed to LEAs and charter schools. Each allotment is a specific amount of resources determined using a set of formulas or rules allocated by the state to implement public education curriculum. It's important to point out though that allotments do not determine the amount of resources that are necessary to ensure a sound and basic education, but rather allotments determine how resources are distributed. To better understand the allotments, they are best placed within the context of the model that the state uses to distribute those resources. The state uses a resource allocation model. The first handout in the next slide shows this model identifies the components necessary for providing a local public education system and then provides those resources for each component. Each component is essentially its own allotment and presents a distinct category of resources. This model is seen as very top down and was developed during a time when all schools were brick and mortar and students attended their assigned district school. As technology has evolved and philosophies of school choice have emerged, and the traditional classroom is given way to alternative education settings, North Carolina now finds itself in a minority of states that use this resource allocation model. The first handout shows that all total the state used 37 different allotments to distribute 8.4 billion to charter schools and LEAs during the 2014-15 school year. To put this amount in perspective, 8.1 billion of this came from the general fund, which represents more than a third of the general fund budget for 2014-15 fiscal year. The allotments can be generalized into four types. There are base allotments, grants, allotments based on student characteristics, as well as LEA characteristics. Base allotments generally go, base allotments represent the largest portion at 82%, and generally go to all LEAs to support the cost of educating the general student. These allotments are commonly based on average daily membership or ADM. You'll hear me use the term ADM throughout this presentation. ADM is a commonly used student accounting tool. Student accounting is the practice of measuring and monitoring the number of students in membership within a given LEA or charter school. The 37 allotments distribute two types of resources, positions and dollars. The position allotments are important because these are the hallmark of the resource allocation model. These are circled in orange on the slide and appear in your handout as unshaded boxes. Position allotments allow LEAs to employ a number of people specified by the state. The state then covers the cost of the salaries and benefits for whoever fills this position. Like the number of positions, the salaries for each position allotment are also established in law. The other allotments come as dollars. These dollars ensure LEAs can hire staff and purchase goods that are consistent with implementing state curriculum. Of the 8.4 billion in state resources allocated to LEAs and charter schools, nearly 60% are distributed as positions. 
Of the nearly 5 billion in position allotments, more than 75% of this is wrapped up in the classroom teacher allotment. Now one nuance of the allotments that's important to kind of demystify is that despite having very specific categories, each allotment cannot be misconstrued for how resources are to be spent. This exhibit shows that nearly 95% of all resources are expended on salaries and benefits. So despite all 37 different allotments all intended to represent some component of the state's education delivery model, at the end of the day, funds are spent on people. To further understand the allotments, it's useful to understand the allotment process which begins with the initial allotments. A full exhibit of this process is provided as handout two and can be found under exhibit five on page 10 of the full report. The initial allotments are the first allotments distributed to LEAs. There are 19 different initial allotments. These 19 initial allotments are important because they account for 92% of all resources distributed to LEAs. Because these 19 account for such a large portion of the allotments, they became the focus of the findings in section one of this report. In addition, we've included an analytic compendium on each of the 19 initial allotments. It can be found starting on page 85 of the full report. The compendium is quite detailed. It consolidates information and analytics for each initial allotment and provides a combination of information on eligibility, distribution policy, and analysis of how each allotment works across the LEAs. After the initial allotments have been made in accordance with state law, DPI conducts a series of revisions throughout the school year. These revisions distribute federal funds and other state allotments as funding comes available. Revisions are also made to track and adjust for transfers that are made between allotments. Allot allotment transfers move resources from one allotment to another. And in general, transfers are permissible for most allotments and are made at the discretion of the LEA. All told, there were 50 different revisions that took place during the 14-15 school year that had a value of $1.6 billion. Now, if this picture looks complicated, there's good reason for that. It is. There are 37 different allotments, all distributing different resources using different distributional and expenditure criteria. On top of that, we allow trading and transferring among allotments, which can help or harm LEAs that may not be astute on how to navigate the allotment system. This picture only begins to shed a little light on the size and complexity of the problems with the current allotment system, which are detailed in the next 12 findings. Now I'm going to march through the findings of the evaluation. Recall we've decided to structure this into two sections. Section 1 deal, deals with a lot of specific issues. This includes findings 1 through 7. This section identifies issues with individual allotments. Finding 1. The structure of the classroom teacher allotment results in a distribution of resources across LEAs that favors wealthy counties. The allotment for classroom teachers is critical for a couple reasons. First, it's widely accepted in academic literature that teachers remain one of the most influential yet controllable determinants or predictors of student performance. This allotment is also important because it represents the single largest allotment LEAs receive. Recall from the taxonomy of allotments, the system distributes two types of resources, positions and dollars. The classroom teacher allotment is a position allotment, which allows LEAs to employ personnel up to a number specified by st student position ratios and pay those personnel based upon a statewide salary schedule. Both the ratios and the salary schedule are established in law. 
With position allotments, the state pays the cost for whoever fills the positions. Position allotments are provided in terms of months of employment for the various types of positions. Most important to keep in mind the structure of the classroom teacher allotment is that resources are tied to the teacher who fills the position. This is because the state pays for the salaries and benefits of whoever fills that position. Simply put, the resources follow the teachers through the position allotment. The picture on the slide walks you through the state salary schedule, which is provided as the third handout and can be found on page 15 of the full report. The state salary schedule is set in law and dictates what the state pays teachers from the classroom teacher allotment. The salary schedule is pegged to three factors that serve as proxy for compensation based on indicators of teacher quality. The first is teacher experience. As the number of years increases, so does compensation. The salary schedule also differentiates based on education. Lastly, teachers can receive additional compensation for being board certified. It's important to note there is an ongoing pilot that is being implemented that is looking to broaden teacher salaries through differential pay, which can provide additional compensation for teachers based on who, what, where, and how well they teach. But with regards to how the allotment currently works, because the state pays the cost, both salaries and benefits, for whoever fills the position, the resources follow the teachers wherever they choose to teach. This means that LEAs, with the most experienced, educated, and credentialed teachers, receive more funding through this allotment. This is problematic because quality teachers are not evenly distributed throughout the state, <coughs> which means the dollars the state pays through the allotment are not evenly distributed. Ultimately, teachers select where they choose to teach. This is called teacher sorting. Teacher sorting is well established in academic literature and has shown that teacher preferences include, are, are influenced by pay, working conditions, and student characteristics. Research has also shown that more experienced, qualified teachers are concentrated in wealthier districts. Now, DPI has affirmed there is an uneven distribution of quality teachers in a 2014 report to the federal government. The report articulated differences in teacher characteristics among schools related to wealth and concentrations of minority students, finding that more experienced and qualified teachers are generally more concentrated in wealthy districts with lower minority populations. Because of this, we chose to examine the classroom teacher allotment within this context. Now, because the factors of teacher quality are so heavily tied to the classroom teacher allotment through the salary schedule, our analysis of the allotment shows the classroom teacher allotment favors the wealthiest LEAs. Specifically, as LEA wealth increases, so does the amount or value an LEA receives through the classroom teacher allotment. Now, to be fair, LEAs are permitted to use other allotments to supplement teacher pay. In addition, LEAs may use local funds to supplement teacher pay. But our analysis shows the use of other allotments and local funds to supplement pay is minimal and does not mitigate the structural deficiency of the allotment. Now, before we move on, let's be clear. We're not suggesting that the structure of the classroom teacher allotment causes teacher sorting. Teacher preferences cause teacher sorting. But the structure of allotting positions exacerbates the issue and does not correct for it. Now, although this allotment was designed not to favor certain LEAs or provide disproportionate amounts of resources, make no mistake that the unintended consequence of teacher preferences are real and present throughout the state. Finding two, the children with disabilities allotment fails to differentiate based on instructional arrangements or settings required and contains a funding cap 
that results in disproportionately fewer resources going to LEAs with more students to serve. State law establishes North Carolina's commitment to ensuring educational opportunity for children with disabilities. The allotment for children with disabilities is important because it represents the second largest state allotment. Furthermore, these students are covered under federal law to ensure adequate services are in place to meet their educational needs. All told, there was 716 million allotted to LEAs through the Children with Disabilities allotment. For school-aged children, the state provides a flat amount of $3,927 per qualified student. However, funding for this group is capped at 12.5% of the LEA's total ADM. This finding will show that distributing a flat amount of capped funding on a per student basis is not only imprecise, but it can be problematic. Children with disabilities are diagnosed along a spectrum of disorders. A student can be diagnosed with a single disorder or can have multiple co-occurring disorders. This means both the severity and the service setting for students can vary. For example, there could be one student working through dyslexia that has ADD, ADHD. This could require minimal services and visiting a resource provider once or twice a week. Juxtapose this to another student diagnosed with cerebral palsy. This child can also be diagnosed with autism and could require their own self-contained classroom. The costs and setting to serve both of these students is very different. But recall, funding provides a flat amount of about $3,900 per student. This means that funding fails to distinguish among very different categories of disability, levels of severity, or costs of providing services. In addition to not differentiating between setting or severity, placing a cap on funding is problematic because children with disabilities are not uniformly distributed across the state. The map display shows the children with disabilities headcount across all 115 LEAs. LEAs colored in the two lightest shades are at or below the funding cap. These LEAs receive $3,927 per student. LEAs shaded in the two darkest colors had populations of children with disabilities that exceeded the cap. As a result, these LEAs received less than $3,927 per student. All told, more than half the LEAs across the state exceeded the cap in the 2014-15 school year. Now the cap was put in place in an effort to disincentivize over-identification of disabled students. However, one must question the effect of such a policy when over half the LEAs exceed the cap. The cap is problematic because it results in disproportionate distribution of resources across LEAs. LEAs with the greatest rates of children with disabilities end up receiving disproportionately fewer resources than LEAs at or below the cap. Finding three, the allotment for limited English proficiency students contradicts principles of economies of scale and contains a minimum funding threshold that results in some LEAs serving LEP students without any funding. The purpose of the LEP allotment is to provide additional funds to LEAs and charter schools for students with limited English proficiency. In fiscal year 14-15, the state distributed $77.6 million across 109 LEAs and 21 charter schools. In order to be eligible for LEP funding, an LEA or charter school must have at least 20 students or at least 2.5% of its ADM with limited English proficiency. As the previous slide showed, the formula contains a concentration factor. Concentration is measured 
as the ratio of LEP students to non-LEP students. This factor ensures more funding flows to LEAs with higher concentrations of LEP students. However, this is problematic because it results in funding disparity. Let's take a look at a couple of examples to show you how this factor can distort funding. This graphic can be found as Exhibit 12 on page 27 of the full report. In our first example, we're going to compare Montgomery and Cumberland County. As you can see, Montgomery County had almost half the number of LEP students as Cumberland County. However, Cumberland County receives nearly the same in funding to educate twice as many LEP students. This is because Cumberland County has a lower concentration of LEP students when compared to Montgomery County. Now let's compare Asheboro City and Pitt Counties. As the example shows, Pitt County educates almost 50 more LEP students than Asheboro County. However, Asheboro receives nearly 75% more in state funds despite serving 49 fewer students. That's because Asheboro has a much higher concentration than Pitt County. The concentration factor not only distorts funding, but it runs counter to the fundamental economic principle of economies of scale. As the ratio of LEP students increases, the marginal cost per student doesn't increase, as the current formula suggests. The LEP formula also includes a minimum funding threshold, which means that LEAs and charter schools with very low prevalence and concentration of LEP students do not receive any LEP funding. In order to be eligible for funding, an LEA or charter must have at least 20 students as designated as LEP or the headcount must be greater or equal to than 2.5% of the ADM. This results in several LEAs and charter schools not receiving LEP funding despite having LEP students to serve and educate. In fiscal year 14-15, six LEAs and 71 charter schools had LEP students but received no funding because they fell below the minimum funding threshold. In total, these LEAs and charter schools had 332 LEP students who generated zero funding. Finding four. The allotment for small counties is duplicative and not tied to evidence regarding the cost of operating small districts. The small county allotment provides supplemental funding to LEAs with fewer than 3,200 ADM. In fiscal year 14-15, the allotment distributed 42 million in small county supplemental funds across 27 different LEAs. Now, funds for small county are predicated on the same economic principle of economies of scale. The rationale for providing supplemental funding is that there are economies of scale in providing education from which smaller districts cannot benefit. And thus, these LEAs require additional funding to cover the cost of the relative inefficiencies that result from administering smaller districts. The table on the slide shows that as LEA size increases, small county supplemental funding generally declines. Now this follows the conventions of the economic principle of economies of scale. However, the amounts allotted are established in legislation. They were not determined through any formal cost analysis regarding the cost of operating small districts. The table on the previous slide showed that LEAs with ADM of up to 3,200 students are eligible to receive a small county supplement. However, most other states that provide a supplement for small districts set their threshold at 2,000 students. This is because the general consensus in education finance literature is the cost per student begins to flatten out at about 2,000 students. This evaluation also found that supplemental funds for small counties is somewhat duplicative. Now anytime any of the other allotments include a base amount of funding in it, 
It serves to disproportionately benefit smaller counties. We identified five other allotments with base funding that subsidize smaller LEAs for diseconomies of scale. So we're clear, this report does not discount or question the need for supplemental funding based upon LEA size. However, when additional allotments provide base funding that subsidize small counties, it makes it difficult to evaluate the appropriateness of a specific small county allotment. Furthermore, it makes it really challenging to discern how much supplemental funding is going to smaller LEAs to adjust for diseconomies of scale. <coughs> Finding five, the low wealth allotment formula relies upon a factor that does not accurately assess a county's ability to generate local funding. The purpose of low wealth funding is to provide supplemental funds to counties that do not have the ability to generate sufficient local revenue on their own to support public schools at the state average. Let's be clear, low wealth is not intended to provide assistance to districts with high proportions of disadvantaged students or low income students or even to correct for deficiencies in other state allotments. LEAs are eligible to receive low wealth supplemental funding if they are located in counties in which the calculated county wealth is less than 100% of the state average wealth. Based upon the formula, in fiscal year 14-15, 78 LEAs received $200 million in low wealth supplemental funding. There are three weighted factors that determine a county's wealth. 40% is based upon the anticipated total county revenue per ADM as a percent of the state average. 10% is based on the adjusted property tax base per square mile as a percent of the state average. And 50% is based upon the county's average per capita income as a percent of the state average. However, one of these factors lacks a logical rationale. Let me walk you through why the adjusted property tax base per square mile is flawed. Let's compare Hyde and Gaston County. In Hyde County, the property tax per square mile is 1.8 million. In Gaston, it's 40.2. Using this factor as it is, Hyde appears far less wealthy than Gaston. However, this funding factor does not account for the number of students per square mile that are intended to be supported by the property tax base. See, Gaston has 95 students per square mile to one student per square mile in Hyde. Now when you do the math, the adjusted property tax base per, square, per student in Hyde is 1.8 million. Compare this to Gaston, that is just 424,000 in adjusted property tax base per student. Now on its face, Hyde may have appeared far less wealthy than Gaston, but in reality, Hyde is four times the property tax base per student than Gaston does. This is because the factor fails to take into account the number of students per square mile to educate. Finding six. The allotment for disadvantaged students provides disproportionate funding across LEAs. The purpose of disadvantaged student supplemental funding, or DSSF funding, is to address the capacity of LEAs to meet the needs of disadvantaged students. In fiscal year 14-15, LEAs were allotted a total of 80 million through the DSSF allotment. Individual LEAs were allotted as much as 6 million and as little as 41,000. All LEAs are eligible for DSSF funding. However, the 16 pilot LEAs have been held harmless from their original 2006-2007 funding level. This whole harmless policy results in disproportionate funding. This table shows how the whole harmless policy disproportionately benefits the 16 pilot LEAs. Now, as you can see, 16 pilot LEAs receive almost five times per student more than non-pilot LEAs. 
Now, there may be a rationale for providing more funding to LEAs with the greatest number of disadvantaged students. However, the 16 hold harmless LEAs are not all the LEAs with the greatest concentrations of disadvantaged students. Finding seven is about how funds for central office administration are distributed. Now, at one time, funding for central office administration had been based upon the number of students within a given LEA. This makes sense. Larger LEAs may require more administrative staff, whereas smaller LEAs would require fewer staff. This is no longer the case. Funding for central office administration was decoupled from changes in student membership in early 2000. This creates an imbalance in the distribution of funds across LEAs. Let's take again, look at a couple of examples that help illustrate the funding disparity. Let's take a look at our first example, Union and Davidson County. They both received almost identical funding, 1.1 million for central office administration. However, Union County serves more than twice the number of students Davidson County does. This disparity in size and this disparity in, in size and funding has to do with the fact that Union County has grown by more than 66% since the General Assembly had frozen the allotment at the 0102 level. A second example shows McDowell and Davie counties. It had almost the same number of students in fiscal year 1415. However, McDowell receives more than $200,000 more through the allotment. This is because the allotment has not kept pace with the growth that has occurred in Davie County since the year 2000. 